welcome all of you to this special briefing uh, on accountability in Syria, achieving transitional justice in post-conflict uh, society. Uh, essentially, it's a combination of a briefing and a, a book review, in a way. And I, I'll explain that uh, in a minute after just making a few introductory remarks. Uh, as most of you know, uh, for the past nine years, as the conflict in Syria continued <laughs> to uh, intensify uh, various parties in the region and actually throughout the international uh, community have advocated persistently uh, for the need to hold the Syrian government and, and other uh, combatants or fighting parties in the conflict to hold them accountable for many crimes against humanity that have been committed uh, you know, going back uh, to the beginning uh, of the conflict. Uh, the demand for accountability increased uh, whenever the fighting kind of tapered down. And conversely, the, the effort tended to peter out or even fizzle as the bloodletting resumed uh, in this fitful and, and violent conflict, uh, somehow assuming that all the attention and all the energies uh, are going into the fighting rather than into ending uh, the conflict and having to deal with the transitional uh, justice uh, stage. So uh, although uh, there was no shortage of uh, probably well-meaning and not so well-meaning uh, political energies uh, spent uh, on in this regard, uh, it's disappointing that very little progress has been made over these long years in holding any of the parties, uh, frankly, uh, responsible or uh, uh, accountable uh, for their atrocities, be they uh, individuals, groups, uh, or state institutions uh, for that uh, matter. Uh, countless investigations have uh, been con conducted uh, throughout this period. I'm, I'm sure uh, most of you are aware of those. Uh, charges have been filed, warrants have been issued, even some arrests have been made, uh, including some uh, rumored arrests uh, as we speak today in, in Europe. Yet, atrocities never ceased uh, to allow for a serious, determined, rational, and sustained process of accountability uh, thus far. So as, as we speak today and as we meet to discuss this important uh, issue, uh, we know the situation in Syria is not doing very well. Uh, the uh, Turkey and Syria uh, are engaged directly and, and indirectly in significant ground and air uh, military uh, confrontations, uh, particularly in the crowded northwestern corner uh, of the country, uh, with the real potential, actually, of drawing others uh, to the fighting, including uh, Russian forces, uh, possibly Iranians, possibly even U.S. troops uh, that are also stationed uh, in the area. There is fear here in Washington that they might be targeted or indirectly kind of dragged into the uh, shooting. Uh, so it could lead uh, to a much bigger fight than what we are with, or have been witnessing the past few days. Uh, the escalation, of course, uh, as we all know, has uh, led to dozens of casualties over the past few days. But more worrisome has been the, the human uh, toil, I mean, it, which is, of course, uh, familiar to most of us since the beginning of this uh, conflict. Uh, the threat uh, to send another uh, large number, maybe hundreds of thousands of additional civilian refugees uh, seeking relative safety. I mean, the, the numbers over the past few days have ranged between 300 and 500, even more, uh, 1,000 people seeking uh, safety along the uh, Turkish uh, border away from this rather crowded, small field of military uh, operations. Uh, at the UN yesterday, the Secretary General, Antonio Guterres, called for cessation of hostilities to keep the situation from getting out of control. But as expected, he didn't fail to disappoint us. Uh, no mention was made of the need to kind of hold the fighting long enough, down long enough to be able to hold the parties uh, accountable for their crimes and, and for their actions. So the focus of our discussion today uh, is really on, on this valiant uh, effort that I attempt, that I refer to during this period to try to uh, keep attention worldwide focused on the issue uh, of accountability and not to be bogged down or totally uh, inundated with the detail of the numbers and the casualties and, and the ugliness uh, of uh, the savagery even uh, of this uh, conflict over the past uh, 
uh, nine years. So the, the, the essential kind of centerpiece of our conversation today is uh, the book uh, that uh, these three special guests uh, have uh, participated in. It was edited by uh, my colleague, uh, Radwan Ziadi, who's a senior fellow here uh, at the Arab Center, Washington, D.C., where he deals uh, chiefly with the issues uh, pertaining uh, to, uh, to, to the Syrian crisis. Uh, Radwan has uh, spoken on behalf of the people in Syria uh, since the beginning of this conflict, uh, before many, many uh, audiences in this country and internationally. He has testified uh, before the UN Human Rights Council in Geneva. He has testified before uh, different committees in Congress and, and spoken to many uh, members uh, of Congress uh, individually. Uh, in addition, uh, he um, uh, decided that we could, should also involve two of his colleagues in writing uh, this book, uh, two who are familiar with you, who have been involved in uh, Syrian issues uh, over the past uh, few years and in Arab uh, issues and human rights, uh, particularly here uh, in Washington. May Sadani has been uh, our guest uh, before. We're delighted to have her. She's the legal and judicial uh, director at the Tahrir uh, Institute for Middle East Policy, uh, where she focuses on uh, building a program that aims uh, to contribute to a stronger legal culture in and about uh, the, the Middle East. Uh, in addition to me, uh, Mohammed Ala Ghanim uh, is also here, and he's a Syrian pro-democracy campaigner, academic writer, political activist, has covered it all. <laughs> and uh, he has been uh, at it from the very beginning of the conflict. And I remember uh, from 2011, he's been involved in the Syrian pro-democracy struggle, uh, particularly uh, the, the task, the difficult task of uh, trying to get attention uh, here in Washington uh, for the cause uh, uh, of Syria. So uh, what we're going to, to do is uh, give uh, our three uh, briefers or speakers uh, 10, 12 minutes each or so, and uh, beginning with Radwan, who has a short uh, presentation. So I'm going to ask uh, you to, do, uh, to be a little cooper cooperative with the logistics. Just turn around a little bit uh, and watch the screen there, because he has a short uh, uh, video and, and presentation, but then he will uh, resume uh, with the uh, discussion, and then he will be followed by May and, and by uh, Mohammed. Uh, there are cards uh, in front of you at the table and maybe behind you on the uh, windowsill. If you do not have one accessible, just raise your hand. Uh, Q&As uh, will be uh, done uh, basically after they're finished. The speakers are finished, and it will be in writing addressed to specific member of the panel. Uh, and when you're ready, just raise your card, and staff will pick him up and bring him up here for me uh, to read. Radwan, the microphone is yours. Uh, yes. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, thank you, Khalil. Uh, thank you for the Arab Center uh, for the supporting the book and hosting this uh, event. Uh, it's, uh, it's difficult when uh, uh, speak on, on, on Syria these days because it's still uh, th th there are too many issues within uh, w one country. You have the issue of uh, a humanitarian crisis, and then of course the issue of uh, armed conflict, and then the issue of rising of terrorist organization like Al Qaeda and ISIS. And this is why the international community uh, decided actually everyone take one piece and deal with it, because too much complicated to deal with it. And this is why we thought the issue of justice and accountability left out of uh, there is no much talk about it in the political uh, discourse, uh, neither in Geneva nor in Astana or even in, 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 in the key capitals like Washington, D.C. Uh, the book tried actually uh, 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 to raise the issue, the importance of the issue accountability and justice not only for the Syrians and for the region, but also on the international stage. When, when a country, a small countries like Syria, uh, 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 be uh, l like massive human rights violations uh, and gross atrocities in that level, very difficult uh, for such country to deal with it uh, during the conflict or even after.
and this is its need and an attention for the international community. What I'm trying to do actually to go through into the patterns of, of war crimes and crimes against humanity committed in Syria in the last eight years, and how each one, what each one of these, it's required, uh, it's a lot of investigations, uh, and it's need, of course, uh, uh, the importance of, of, of attention. And then May uh, will speak on the efforts of, of accountability and transitional justice, which has been ongoing from the civil society and from the UN and from different international initiatives. Uh, and Mohammed also will touch the issue of enforced, dis uh, enforced displacement, which being the main uh, focus of, of, of the book. Uh, we started actually talking about in 2000, uh, in, in, in 15, uh, we, we, where Aleppo was uh, the center of attention of, of evacuation. But when we see actually uh, this video is taken last week in Ma'arrat al Nu'man. Ma'arrat al Nu'man, it's the main city between uh, Aleppo and, 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 and Damascus. 400,000 inhabitants in the city and see actually uh, the evacuation of 400,000 of people there into the Syrian Turkish border of fear of prosecution and killing by uh, the Assad government and the Russian Air Force. It does give, give us a one sense that what we started as the evacuation in Aleppo, it's continued in the last two and three years, and still, while we are sitting there, it's, it's ongoing. Uh, not the international community failed to address the issue, and it make it more difficult, uh, because the last uh, humanitarian situation in northern, I'm, I'm reading here from the UN figures, we have uh, 11 million IDB in need of humanitarian assistance, uh, 6 million IDB displaced, and the uh, UN estimated more than 500, half a million displaced from Saraqib, Ariha, and Ma'arrat al Nu'man into, uh, in, into the border between uh, Turkey and Syria. And since Turkey already have three million and half and four million refugees, uh, it will not open the door for any uh, more Syrian uh, uh, re refugees. And this is why we we estimating more than uh, four million stuck at the border between Syria and Turkey. Uh, what I'm trying to focus here on, on the patterns of crimes uh, committed in the last eight years. Um, I categorize as five uh, main uh, wa war crimes and crimes against humanity. The use of the Air Force, uh, the use of prohibited weapons, and the siege on uh, the opposition areas and uh, populated areas, and then torture and sectarian crimes, and finally the forced dis displacement. Uh, why I put a genocide there, of course, still, it's a, it's it's a, 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 a debatable among uh, the legal scholars because it's a genocide against the Yazidis uh, in, in in Iraq, ISIS uh, ethnic groups. Uh, but but we believe, personally believe, what's happened in the use of the chemical weapons in 2013 it, for the government it has to intent of of of, of genocide. And we can go more into details uh, 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 later on. Of course, the use of the Air Force uh, and the Syrian government, uh, the Syrian opposition called for the no-fly zone on over in, in, in November 2011. The Syrian government started the use of the Air Force in July 2012. It's considered now, it's the main, uh, 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 the, the, the main force has been used in, in any other uh, civil wars in history. Uh, no other governments or any other military institutions used uh, in, in that level uh, the air force against the populated areas. Uh, and in, in the book, actually, we make some historical comparisons when the Russian, they used, actually, the Air Force in Chechnya before, 
um, and in also the, uh, the the Soviet Union used the Air Force in uh, in, in Afghanistan in 1982. Uh, but in not that level and not continuance, which led uh, to systematic, widespread, and indiscriminate use of, of the Syrian. The signature of the Syrian Air Force, it's the Paril Palms. And then, of course, it's an amazing study done by Harvard in 2012 when we, they collected the data from all the human rights organizations. And they found it at only 1% of, of the people who've been killed by the Paril Palms uh, were rebels or combatants. 99% uh, of, of, of the victims are, uh, are, are, are civilians, among them 25 uh, are children. Uh, and then of course the signature, as I said, uh, uh, the barrel palms, and this video, 30 seconds, shows what the barrel palms is. This is my hometown, Daria. It's a cheap, it costs less than ten dollar, and it just been pushed by helicopter or any air jets. Indiscriminate ways, never recognized. See how they push it. Uh, it, it's. It's created, of course, uh, devastating uh, effects on the civilians. Some, this is some pictures in, in Duma, 2013, 14. And this is some of the pictures in, in Aleppo. And of course, that's led to the evacuation of, of most of the people, as we see now in Ma'arat al-Nu'man. Uh, 400,000 left the city. That's what happened in Daraya, in, uh, in, in other areas who's been targeted by the, uh, the, the, the barrel bombs. Unfortunately, until today, the international community failed actually to prevent the Syrian government from using such kind of weapons. There was an, 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 uh, an, an important try by uh, uh, former Secretary of State John Kerry in 2016 by the Russians, where they put the responsibility on Russia if the Syrian government used the barrel bombs. Uh, uh, the agreement actually uh, uh, lived only by one week. And later on, the Syrian government continued to start the using the barrel bombs. This is some of, 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 of satellite images of the city of Aleppo. Uh, city of Aleppo before 2011, it was 5 million. It's the second largest city in Syria. Uh, now, see, actually, it's, it's, uh, it's uh, all uh, uh, gray uh, areas who are affected by the barrel bombs. The second pattern of crimes of co in, 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 in the Syrian war was the use of the uh, prohibited weapons, uh, especially, as we know, in, 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 in uh, um, in the Hague agreements, uh, the use of the chemical weapons is prohibited, no matter the target. If the target, military target, or the civilian target, it's prohibited because it's, uh, it's designed to cause the, the, uh, the injury and, 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 and easy suffering. But the Syrian government used the prohibited weapons uh, 37 times. And in, if we look into the reports of the OPCW, uh, it's confirmed the use of the chemical weapon 37 times in different areas in Syria. And, and until today, uh, uh, neither the, the UN or the OBCW will be able uh, uh, to, stay, to state clearly in their, uh, in their statement about the responsibility. It's, uh, it's, it's been three tries uh, to investigate the use of the chemical weapons, and they confirm the use of the chemical weapons. But according to the rules and the veto on Russians, uh, uh, that prevent from mentioning uh, the responsibility of the Syrian government or the Assad government of the use of the chemical uh, weapons. And then of course, uh, we all see these uh, photos in, uh, in Eastern Ghouta in 2013, then later on. The third pattern of crimes, which uh, has much more focus in, in the first chapter in the book, of course, The Siege. Uh, 
because the seas is not being used anymore by the Syrian government and with the international community has short memory forget uh, the horror happens for one million and a half Syrians who's been under siege uh, since 2012 started on November 2012 until 2017 this is the picture of Ahmed who's actually the first one in Madaya who's been died uh, because lack of, 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 of food of the siege in, in the book, it details that the third, uh, and, uh, and, and Jeanine also wrote an interesting book. It's a comparison between the Bosnia and Herzegovina, and she was in Sarajevo, which was considered as the longest siege in history, comparing to the siege in Aleppo, which actually, and later on in, in, uh, in, in, in Eastern Ghouta. Uh, the, the siege, it, it's, it's important because it's a scandal not only to the international community, to the UN itself. The UN itself, the first report Ocher uh, issued, uh, it says actually the situation in Madaya as example, uh, it's, it, it, and, and they have access to food and water on. And later on, three weeks later, a breakdown of one of the cases of Ahmed, that's, that's the situation. And that's, of course, create uh, criticism within the UN mechanism, within the UN uh, debate. That's the reporting on Syria within the UN, uh, it wasn't accurate enough and rely more and more on, on resources from the Syrian government rather than actually uh, do uh, an, an independent research or reach out to, uh, 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 to the areas. Uh, because since the first uh, uh, siege started uh, in, in, in Syria in, in, in 2012, until 2017, at least 13 Security Council resolution issued regarding the Syria area. And each Security Council resolution refer into more areas. The, the first one, uh, 1680, refer into 35 areas under siege. Later on, it became 54 areas, where at that time, the UN trying to mediate in Geneva and in Astana, but actually the siege being intensified by the government, and it became strategy by itself by the Syrian government to impose, uh, uh, to, to impose a surrender for all these areas and as a total punishment uh, to the civilians uh, who decided uh, to stay there or to live there. And then of course, the results of, 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 of the, those, all 54 areas who were under siege was the evacuation, which Mohammed can talk more about it. And all, of course, in what we call it, uh, this is not uh, green buses. Uh, the, the, the green buses became uh, a norm uh, uh, to put more, more, more the population and send them uh, uh, into northern part of Syria. The fourth, uh, uh, the fourth uh, uh, elements of the pattern of war crimes and crimes against humanity, of course, the crimes of torture. Nobody knows or have an estimate number of the political prisoners in Syria. But uh, mostly from 80 to 125,000. And this is actually pictures smuggled by Caesar, who is now passed into law, Caesar law. 55 uh, uh, photos shows, uh, uh, sh shows the, the systematic torture uh, inside the Syrian secret prisons. Uh, um, and of course, that's led to the uh, uh, to the what now is Caesar bill. Uh, the fourth, uh, 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 the fifth element, and the final one, the forced uh, displacement. What I found the book actually uh, that most of the displacement, uh, the forced displacement, not based on the sectarian uh, divide rather than the political divide. If that doesn't make it in much, uh, I mean, the, the, the target, the political target of the Syrian government, not for the groups, they are actually uh, uh, um, Sunni or, or it, it, it's as non-loyal to the Syrian government. Uh, um, and this is why uh, 
uh, is not make it much easier to be non uh, non sectarian target rather than a political target of course uh, uh, the displacement which led to the uh, to the more than seven million refugees uh, 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 Syrian abroad. And in, of course, after all of these policies and targets, the Syrian government issued dozens of laws to prevent uh, uh, displaced people or the refugees from returning back. Uh, uh, returning back, the degree 66, uh, degree 12, 2006, and then of course the final one, the law 10, 2018, uh, uh, which been all of them have been uh, applied uh, um, uh, uh, today. And of course, that's led to the flee of the Syrian refugees. The peak of the crisis was 2014-2015. Uh, uh, and now, if the campaign in, uh, in Idlib intensify and continue, we'll expect actually uh, uh, even another uh, peak of the Syrian refugees, especially uh, uh, those who are in the border between Syria uh, uh, and, and Turkey. Um, and it's still Zaatari is uh, one of the second largest uh, uh, refugee camps in the world uh, and continue, unfortunately, uh, to stay like that. Uh, uh, thank you very much. Sure. Uh, thank you, Khalil and Radwan, for having me and Radwan for inviting me to contribute to the book. Um, I think Radwan's presentation really drives home why it's so difficult to talk about accountability in Syria. How do you even begin? The extent of war crimes and crimes against humanity that have taken place, the fact that there are an immense amount of perpetrators involved, the fact that these crimes continue even now with impunity, including the forced displacement of the people of Idlib, which is happening as we speak. Um, it's overwhelming, to say the least. But at the same time, it drives home, I think, two very important things around, two lessons around accountability. The first is that the time for justice is now, and that justice is not a marginal conversation. So since the very beginning, you heard Radwan talk about justice being a sideline conversation. But in actuality, when Syrians peacefully took to the streets in 2011 to demand freedom and justice, part of the reason they took to the streets was because they wanted to hold their governments accountable for crimes. So honoring the Syrian people and, and the 500,000 plus who have been killed and the millions displaced and the millions made refugees really starts and ends with the question of accountability. And it's something that should be on an ongoing conversation. It's not something we can afford to wait until violence comes to an end because there are many tools of accountability that can and have been accessed by civil society. And I would say the second lesson is that Syria has taught us to be creative in the accountability space. A lot of the traditional legal mechanisms that had been in place in the wake of the Holocaust and otherwise have proven to be either politicized or difficult to access. Things like the International Criminal Court, things like the doctrine, responsibility to protect, these are things that have, made, have been made almost useless, I hate to say, by the experiences that we've had in Syria. And so I'd like to spend the rest of uh, my remarks laying out sort of three categories of accountability tools and mechanisms that are being engaged on. And I think that uh, will hopefully add a little bit of, of hope to the conversation that was, it's very sobering to hear. The first uh, set of tools are those of documentation. The idea of documentation in and of itself as a tool for accountability. Very early on in the Syrian war, Syrian civil society organizations, journalists, lawyers recognized that if they weren't documenting what was happening, who was doing it, and who was being affected, that no one else really would. This was because the space for journalism increased, like de increasingly uh, existed. It was, became difficult, if not impossible, for journalists to safely cover what was happening in Syria. Um, it became very difficult for civil society organizations not to be targeted, for the leaders in civil society organizations not to be arrested. And so it became that much more important to document for two purposes, both for the sake of influencing and informing policy, but also for the long term. And that was to preserve the history and really to give credence to the lived realities that Syrians had undergone. 
particularly in the wake of these disinformation campaigns that we're seeing by Russia and otherwise, it's more important than ever for Syrians to have a place to have documented what happened to them, as opposed to being told by external actors what's happening. This documentation, of course, help, has helped contribute to a sense of truth and a sense of, a sense of narrative. And I think it's extremely important that we pause and recognize that as a goal of accountability by itself. Um, it's not enough, obviously, but it is an important tool of accountability. The same documentation has been used for a number of different tools. We've seen open source investigations by excellent organizations like Bellingcat, the work of New York Times journalists who have been able to actually look at what is being documented and say, these were the perpetrators, this is what happened. And of course, we've seen documentation for the sake of legal accountability and evidence collection as well. There are organizations around the US, around Europe, that are actively collecting evidence in the hopes that one day there will be a space to prosecute these crimes. Um, I think documentation overall shows us that there, there are immediate things that we should and can be investing in and that they serve different purposes, whether that is truth, um, legal prosecution, or, or otherwise. The second bucket of accountability tools that I want to delve into are the UN mechanisms. And I would be remiss if I didn't start this off by saying that the UN has let down the Syrian people. Not just the UN, I would say the international community as well. The tools at their disposal, whether it has been the International Criminal Court, the UN Security Council, issues like the politicization of aid, these are things that books can be written on and should be written on one day. It's not the focus of my uh, talk today, but I, I did want to start recognizing that. At the same time, though, there are two tools that I'd like to point out when it comes to UN mechanisms that have served an important uh, role in this space for accountability. The first has been the UN Commission of Inquiry on Syria, which was established in August uh, 2011. That uh, body is responsible for investigating human rights abuses, and it has issued a number of important reports that have given credence to the civil society documentation that has been done. It's been, an, uh, and, and that body has recognized perpetrators that have committed certain crimes, but has documented things in reports that I think will continue to be useful for a long time, whether it's things like sexual and gender-based violence, violations affecting children, the issue of the return of refugees, and this commission continues to do important work. And the second I want to focus on is really, um, it's called the International Independent Impartial Mechanism, what is known as the Triple IM. This is a body that was created out of a recognition that Syrians likely weren't going to access the International Criminal Court. And it looked to be difficult, if not impossible, for there to be a space to prosecute crimes inside Syria, of course. And so this body was created thanks to the involvement of accountability actors all over the world to really say that we want to create an entity the role of which will be to collect evidence, to put together case files that could then actually be sent to courts and jurisdictions around the world so that these cases can be prosecuted. This is a relatively new entity, but it's a very heartening, I think, example of what can be done when we think creatively about what works and what doesn't, and also think critically about, about how we can look long term. And the final uh, bucket of accountability tools I'd like to, to talk a little bit about are really prosecutions outside of Syria. Uh, like I said before, the International Criminal Court is difficult to access. It's not impossible, thanks to the excellent work of organizations like Guernica that are thinking of ways to access the court via refugees that are now in Jordan. There's a lot of interesting work being done in this space, but at the same time, it remains really unlikely. Syria is not a signatory to the Rome Statute, and the only other primary way that the case would make it to the UN Security Council is via the uh, UN, uh, sorry, to the International Criminal Court is via a UN Security Council referral and made impossible thanks to the vetoes of Russia and China, which have been consistent vetoes since the beginning of the war. Um, that being said, the International Criminal Court is not the only entity. Um, there there has been a reinvigorated attention towards really being creative about how Syrians can access justice. And I would say this is being done through a concept broadly defined as extraterritorial jurisdiction. The idea that even if a crime was not committed in a particular country, that particular country should have an interest in prosecuting that crime, particularly crimes of a extensive, immense nature, like war crimes, genocide, torture. 
Um, a specific uh, subset of that jurisdiction is, is the idea of universal jurisdiction, which irrespective of whether the perpetrator is from a particular country, irrespective of whether the victim is from a particular country, a country might have an interest to prosecuting these crimes because it wants to send a message that these are crimes that the international community has collectively stated cannot and will not stand. And we're seeing a lot of really good work being done in this space. I would say I point your attention to a few. Um, there's so many organizations, so I don't want to list all of the organizations involved in this space, but I would say there have been um, structural investigations that have been started in Germany, Sweden, um, and France that are looking into the Syrian war more broadly to identify potential cases that are being brought. There are specific cases that have already been brought and are in the investigation phase um, across Europe uh, that thanks to the excellent work of civil society organizations, Syrian and otherwise. Um, and those cases are, are very promising. And in fact, there is a, the first ever torture case is set to actually be heard later this year in 2020, thanks to the effort and work of these civil society organizations and legal advocates. And there are arrest warrants, like Khalil mentioned, that have been issued in furtherance of particular cases. And while it can seem difficult or politicized to be able to implement these arrest warrants, the fact that they've been issued means that there is momentum and that they're it's sending a strong message, I would say, that these are crimes that cannot be allowed to stand. Um, I don't want to go into too much detail because I can talk about accountability all day long, but I do want to end on a sort of what can we do about it note. Um, I think there's a lot that can be done. There is no doubt that Syria has driven home the reality that a lot of the mechanisms that we have need to be amended, improved, strengthened. We need to think critically about what things, slogans like never again, if these are slogans or if they actually mean something to us in, as an international community. And we need to look really hard about what it means and why accountability is important and how it's so central to peace uh, and justice, of course. Um, I would say that as advocates, there are a few things that can be done. Advocates should be engaging with their governments to encourage their governments to set aside more funding for accountability efforts, whether that's civil society organizations or otherwise. Advocates should be engaging with their governments and lobbying those governments to improve their human rights laws. Here in the U.S., we have pretty weak universal jurisdiction laws. And while we have had a successful civil suit brought under the Foreign Sovereign Immunities Act on behalf of the family of Marie Colvin, we don't have the same criminal, uh, the same strong criminal accountability laws that we see in other European countries. We can be advocating with the U.S. government to really fill these loopholes and gaps. And there are initiatives uh, by the ABA and otherwise to begin to think critically about filling these gaps. I would also say, um, Lobbying your governments and advocates should be engaging with governments to give more funding to entities like the Triple IM. As we know, these entities are only as strong as the funding and political support that they receive. Um, and finally, I would say, as those in the civil society and legal space have have led this conversation and I think continuing to think about ways to engage Syrian civil society, thinking as lawyers how we can translate materials into Arabic in order to reach and access Syrian victims and Syrian civil society organizations to make sure they're driving the conversation and they're a part of the conversation. Setting aside programming towards training and, and explainers and funding, explaining things like universal jurisdiction, like the ICC, like these entities that can often be technical and can seem out of hand. I think there's a a lot that can be done, um, but I will say that I, I firmly believe and I think we all believe that accountability is an integral part of the conversation and it's something that can't be sidelined or marginalized. And if any of the uh, peace processes or constitutional processes or whatever they may be stand any chance, accountability really has to be at the center of that conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, first off, I'd like to thank the Arab Center in Washington, D.C. I'd like to thank uh, uh, Khalil Rodwan uh, for giving me, uh, giving me this opportunity to, to address you today and uh, uh, to also co contribute to the, to the book. Uh, Rodwan asked me to take a deep dive into uh, the phenomenon of forced displacement uh, and demographic re-engineering in the country, population transfers. Uh, which is what the chapter, which is what, what my chapter uh, actually discusses. Now, as you know, as we uh, gather here today, uh, sadly, 
uh, hundreds of thousands of people in, uh, in the province of Idlib are being subjected to a systematic uh, forced uh, displacement uh, campaigns. Now, uh, campaign. Now, the thing about Idlib uh, is that Idlib is technically the site of a so-called de-escalation zone. Uh, this de-escalation de zone, uh, which is pretty much uh, province-wide uh, ceasefire. So this de-escalation de zone was negotiated by Russia, Turkey, and Iran as part of the Astana uh, process. Um, but so what, you, what we're witnessing today is the liquidation of the ceasefire or the liquidation, um, the liquidation of the, this de-escalation zone. In 2018, uh, in southern Syria, the province of Dara'a also saw a similar fate. There was also another de-escalation zone in Dara'a. Uh, uh, this time it was uh, negotiated between Russia and uh, the United States. And the province also saw uh, a similar fate. Hundreds of thousands, actually tens of thousands of people in Dara'a were forcibly uh, displaced from their homes. Before that, uh, um, uh, before that, Ghouta, eastern Ghouta, uh, the suburbs of Damascus, northern, northern country side of Damascus, also uh, was the site of a de-escalation zone. Also as a result of that, uh, people were forcibly displaced using the green buses that Dr. Radwan Ziadeh uh, talked about. Before that, Homs. So my chapter looks at these patterns of forced displacement. And it makes a counterintuitive claim. The claim that the chapter makes um, is that these ceasefires, whether they're called local ceasefires, local truces, de-escalation zones, uh, freeze, uh, freeze zones as they were called by uh, the United Nations, eventually always lead to uh, forced uh, displacement and population transfers. So what I did was I actually surveyed um, all, of the all of the examples of uh, the communities in Syria that were forcibly displaced uh, since, 2000 and, uh, since 2012 through uh, 2017. And uh, sadly, uh, there, was always a, there was always a ceasefire uh, in, involved. Uh, so that was always the eventual outcome of a, of a ceasefire. Now, um, those ceasefires, when uh, they first came in, into vogue, especially here in Washington, D.C., in 2014, uh, they were really misunderstood by, uh, by analysts uh, in D.C., two former, um, I, uh, two former Obama administration officials, for example, in a paper they, they wrote, uh, talked about those local ceasefires as an example of what they called the ink blot strategy. Uh, and basically said they can lead to win-win uh, uh, situations. Uh, you also had Carnegie, for example, another think tank, uh, also published a paper, and they said uh, those ceasefires could eventually empower communities, and, and uh, uh, they said such ceasefires could turn into more lasting agreements for local uh, governors. They could embolden and empower civilian communities, making it harder for their leaders and commanders to order a return to armed uh, conflict. United Nations, too, uh, also embraced some of those uh, ceasefire. Uh, John, uh, one of the humanitarian leaders of the United Nations, also said they could be, uh, he was talking about the ceasefire in Homs that also eventually saw the forced displacement or, or evacuation of tens of thousands of people from uh, from Homs itself and then eventually from Wa'ar. Also, as he said, it's, quote, an example of what could be, um, what could be done. Uh, now, this effusive praise that those, uh, what I call, I call them bogus peace deals, received uh, actually emboldened, uh, I, I, I argue that they emboldened the Assad regime. OK, so that's the first claim that I make. The second claim that I make is that uh, by exhaustively looking at all of the case studies, one can't help but conclude that these ceasefires that always eventually led to forced displacements and population transfers were uh, an integral part of Assad's military strategy. So how does, uh, how do, uh, how does a ceasefire eventually lead to demographic re-engineering? Again, it's a counterintuitive claim, but that's a claim I make, and uh, I have provided um, a lot of, I have provided a lot of examples. I looked at Homs, uh, 
uh, looked at Aleppo, eastern Ghouta, Dar'a, uh, uh, the suburbs of Damascus, Babila, Kabun, uh, the hometown of Dr. Rudwan Ziade, Dariya. Uh, and I argue that those ceasefires actually served two core purposes. First purpose was to help the Assad regime uh, eventually conquer densely populated urban areas. So that was goal number one. Uh, the, the, the ceasefire, a ceasefire in a particular locale actually, uh, like would, act, would, uh, would actually uh, take place after a, let's say, a given town or village was besieged for, say, a year or two, or, uh, people within that locale would be reduced to, uh, to eating grass, stray cats and dogs, like we saw in Ma'addamiya, uh, uh, for example, until they eventually had to agree to uh, very harsh terms. Things like those communities had to, uh, for example, relinquish heavy weapons in case they had any, uh, uh, in case they had any heavy weapons. Uh, the fighters in those towns uh, had to be evacuated to the, to, to the province of, uh, of Idlib. Uh, so basically, dispossessing those towns or robbing those towns of any defense mechanisms in case those cease, or in, in a, in a uh, case of those ceasefires or the terms of those, th those ceasefires not being honored by uh, the Assad regime, which is what happened. Uh, the chapter also discusses what I called the ratcheting effect. So initially, the regime would, would ask, uh, for example, for the flag of the Assad regime to be flown in a, in a particular town in return for uh, some aid access. Eventually, uh, that aid access would be curtailed or limited. And then the Assad regime would, be, uh, would renege on the deal, and they would ask for more and more and more and more until the town, a particular town, would uh, uh, eventually be completely, uh, completely overrun. Of course, overrunning a town only happened after the town had been systematically uh, weakened over uh, an extended period of time. The second objective that I argue these uh, ceasefires uh, served was to relieve the chronic shortage of manpower that the Assad regime had to deal with. The Assad regime, as a minority uh, regime in 2011, 2012, uh, played a game uh, of, of whack-a-mole in Syria. They, would, they had elite forces. They were unable to rely on their entire military. So they had elite forces. And they would focus their elite forces, uh, such as the 4th Armored Mechanized Division, on a given uh, let's say, city like, uh, or neighborhood like uh, Baba Amr in, in Homs. They would decimate the opposition in that neighborhood only for the opposition to, uh, for opposition to emerge in a different neighborhood, uh, say Wa'ar or uh, a completely different province. So they would have to be deployed elsewhere. And you know, after you do that for a year or two, uh, after they did that for a year or two, they, became, they were uh, uh, overstretched, stretched too thin. Uh, and they were fatigued, and that's why they needed support from Iran. That's why eventually they needed uh, a, a full-scale military intervention by Russia. Now, how did those ceasefires help with the, the, the issue or the problem of shortage of manpower that the Assad regime uh, had to struggle with or had to deal with? They froze certain fronts and freed up regime's uh, uh, resources uh, to focus on uh, uh, towns or places, the, uh, according to the regime's uh, military plan or strategy, were deemed as of a uh, to, uh, to have a higher priority. For example, a deal was was struck with the town of or the suburb of Maddamiya, uh, in uh, so south of Damascus, uh, in in uh, 2000 and uh, in 2013. Uh, Ma'addamiya was a restive town. It was an opposition hub. And the Assad and it also provided a launch pad for attacks against the capital, Damascus. So the Assad regime was interested in neutralizing that. But Assad had to deal with Ma'addamiya and Ghouta and Dariya all at the same time. So what they did it was neutralize through a so-called ceasefire the town of Ma'addamiya, which allowed them to focus all of their energy on the town of Dariya. Eventually, the town of Daraya was emptied down to its last resident. They, they, ha they all had to, uh, uh, they, to, to evacuate, quote unquote, evacuate uh, to Ghouta, to Idlib. Uh, 
And then the regime went back and focused their effort, effort on Ma'ad Damiya and uh, took over Ma'ad Damiya. We saw that in Madaya and Zabadani. Dr. Radwan showed you one of the photos from Madaya uh, where that really gruesome siege uh, took place. Uh, Madaya and Zabadani, two towns right next to each other. The regime also did the same, uh, focusing on one town, offering a ceasefire uh, uh, to the other town until both towns uh, were, uh, were overrun. And the same blueprint was used throughout the country. And that's how we, uh, that's how we, ended, uh, that's why, uh, that's how we ended up here uh, today. Now, as I mentioned, uh, the UN was culpable. And this is something, uh, my, that my, chap this is something my chapter uh, looks into. And again, the chapter does not make vague, general, uh, abstract claims. I provide specific examples. Uh, for example, the town of Madaya. Uh, or the area of Madaya and Zabadani, we found out uh, after the fact that uh, the UN operation in Damascus actually uh, allowed the Assad regime to cook the books, quote unquote, or to manipulate the figures that, was, that were used in uh, their reporting uh, and to downplay the significance or how, uh, you know, the, the scale uh, of the suffering in, in Madaya using figures provided by uh, the Assad regime because, as you know, the UN can only work through uh, states and they needed the cooperation of the regime. So I guess that was a compromise that they decided they needed to make. Only after those gruesome images uh, attracted global attention did we fi find out about that uh, major uh, ethical compromise that the UN in Syria uh, made. There was another example, a uh, former UN uh, special envoy to Syria, uh, Stefan Di Mistura, announced an initiative for Aleppo uh, called uh, Free Zones. Uh, and uh, the Assad regime accepted the Free zone, Zones initiative because it dovetailed really nicely with the Assad regime's uh, ceasefire military strategy. While cutting uh, the last uh, supply line to Aleppo. So the last supply line to Aleppo was cut, yet diplomatically, what you heard in the news was that we, we, we made a diplomatic breakthrough. So the third thing that these ceasefires did was provide a, an illusion of a political process. Uh, international actors had something to point to. So we have this, we have, we have de-escalation zones, we have local truces, we have local ceasefires. We're, we're actually doing something. Uh, Dimistura just uh, uh, was able to win this from, the, from the, this major concession from the Assad regime, where in fact uh, that did sort of diplomacy. And I'm not suggesting here that you know, Dimistura really wanted people in Aleppo to starve, but that's eventually how that strategy uh, that, embrace, that embraced the Assad regime's uh, local ceasefire strategy. That's how it translated into into uh, reality. Um, so, uh, as a result, millions of people, Idlib, the province of Idlib, was used as dumping ground uh, until the the most recent campaign in Idlib started. So now we have run. Our people in Idlib have uh, people in Idlib now are not just. Idlib natives, they're from all over the Syria. And they have pretty much run out of places to, to run to because the borders with Turkey are closed. Now, the other thing that I would like to point out is that while I do agree with Dr. Rodwan Ziade about the political objective of conquering and uh, uh, the political objective of, of conquering communities that are not loyal or opposition communities, I think there's also uh, a large and overwhelming body of evidence that points in the direction of sectarian cleansing, uh, demographic engineering uh, that is very, um, that is highly sectarian. For example, uh, we saw uh, what we call the deal of four towns, Madaya, Zabadani, the two towns I've already mentioned that were besieged and eventually uh, accepted as so-called ceasefire. Uh, and then two towns in northern Syria that were besieged by rebel hardliners. The residents of Kafreya and Foa, uh, mostly Shia, were uh, transported to uh, Madaya and Zabadani, repopulated, resettled, sorry, in Madaya and Zabadani. And the residents of Zabada, uh, Madaya and Zabadani were 
were transferred to, to the north. We've seen also that in, in Damascus, for example, in Damascus proper, uh, Iran purchased large tracts of land and some areas were designated for quote unquote redevelopment. Uh, I have a lot of friends who used to live in Mezzeb uh, the heavily, heavily densely populated area. We're talking hundreds, tens of thousands of, uh, of families, hundreds of thousands of people. They all had to evacuate. They all had to leave. They were given notices they had to leave. The state provided them with uh, like uh, a year, uh, uh, a year, uh, two years rent of, um, in return for, uh, or as a, as a form of compensation for basically having to leave their homes. And of course, the so-called two years rent uh, in, in today's Syria is not adequate or wouldn't be sufficient to get you a place for, is only, would be only sufficient to get you a place for a, a few, uh, for a few months. So I have seen uh, evidence of systematic sectarian cleansing also uh, facilitated through uh, local ceasefires or uh, de-escalation zones. Uh, most recently, Dr. Uh, Rudwan, uh, Dr. Rudwan alluded to, to law number 10. So this is a law that the regime issued in 2018, and it basically designates some areas for quote unquote redevelopment. Uh, mostly, uh, I've, I've, seen, uh, I've seen how it, I've seen some reports uh, coming out of Eastern Ghouta, for example, uh, about how communities there had to, uh, initially had 30 days in order to uh, uh, prove that they owned property or closing uh, those properties. Eventually, it was changed from 30 days to a year, but that's where I own two condominiums in Damascus, uh, and I don't have access to them because uh, to have access to them, I would need to prove that I own them, and I would need to, uh, to do it in person. This is something I've personally researched, and doing that it would be tantamount to, to a suicide. I also can ask uh, friends uh, to, or uh, extended family members to sell them on my behalf, uh, pretty, much for the, uh, pretty much for the same reason. So this is another legal tool uh, that is being used to dispossess uh, uh, communities and to uh, uh, conduct, for, to entrench the, reali the realities created through those uh, local ceasefires. Final thing I'd like to say is that we here uh, in the United States, we thought, uh, we looked into what to do to keep these new realities from being entrenched. Uh, one thing we did was share those conclusions with the House Foreign Affairs Committee as they were drafting the Caesar uh, Civilian Protection Act uh, that recently passed. And because of that, um, if, you, if you've had a chance to look at Caesar, Section 7413 specifically looks into this issue. Uh, uh, it talks about strategy relating to areas of Syria in which civilians are subject to forced displacement. And it asks the administration, the Trump administration, calls on the Trump administration to provide strategy specifically to deter uh, the, the, uh, per, uh, 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 turning those uh, new demographic changes into permanent realities. Um, so this is something, it's a start, uh, definitely not sufficient, but it's a start. And we're glad that this is now, uh, it's the law of the land. And it's something that the administration uh, has to implement. Hopefully they, uh, they uh, I hope that they get the implementation right. But it's a step, uh, it's a step uh, along uh, the way. So again, to sum up, uh, the strategy of ceasefires, uh, Regardless of how, what it was called, it was called sometimes it was called local ceasefires, local truces, de-escalation zones, freeze zones, uh, and so forth, was used systematically by the Assad regime to facilitate forced displacement, population transfers, demographic re-engineering, and yes, sectarian cleansing. Uh, those, this, uh, those as peace deals or peace initiatives, they were initially embraced by an some analysts here in Washington, D.C., uh, definitely by the Obama administration in 2016. The Obama administration in 2016 were working on uh, what they called violence reduction measures. Uh, 
uh, by the United Nations, uh, despite uh, Syrians reaching out to uh, all of the aforementioned uh, individuals and entities and saying that uh, those ceasefires are actually not real. Uh, we do, you, you guys call them here ceasefires, we call them kneel or starve. Kneel or starve. You basically have to bow down to uh, our terms or you have to starve because of the sieges that we are going to be imposing on you for a long time and, until you capitulate. Uh, and b b any transitional justice process will have to, in the future to reckon with these realities. Even if the fighting stopped in Syria tomorrow, even if Assad is, you know, is killed or leaves power uh, in Syria tomorrow, we have uh, dozens of communities that remain deeply wounded, that don't have the same populations that they used to have uh, just a couple of years ago. And this is uh, something that any serious, credible, robust transitional justice process will have to look, to look into. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mohammed. I uh, just wanted to remind you again, for those who are interested in following up and getting a copy or taking a look at the, uh, the book, we haven't been able to get copies to sell today. Uh, there is only one uh, sample copy out there. Uh, but there are uh, flyers that were given to you on your way in. They include a 30% coupon uh, in the back for those who are interested. The book has been published by uh, Lexington Books, and they are available uh, both in hardback and in uh, electronic ebook uh, version uh, for those who are uh, interested. Anything else on the publication of the book? Is it going to be the same company marketing it in the States or? Yes. Yeah, okay. Uh, I asked him about the publication itself. One, one thing you learn pretty quickly uh, about the business of uh, academic publishing is that by the time uh, the, 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 the final product is out, uh, it, it, it really takes a long time for an academic, especially peer reviewed academic book to be published. Uh, so some of the things uh, some of the things that I personally have in the book uh, uh, may have uh, been overtaken by events. Sadly, however, only in the sense that the trends I identified only got in worse, uh, not, any, uh, not any better. But uh, it's something I learned about academic publishing. It, it takes a really long time for uh, the book to finally come out. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Uh, the first question I have is addressed to May. It's from Roger uh, Phillips, legal director, SJAC. Uh, given the focus of the, uh, what you mentioned uh, with regards to the universal jurisdiction prosecutors uh, on extremist fighters, can we expect comprehensive justice from this mechanism? And how can average Syrians contribute to justice efforts given all the limitations that you have mentioned? Sure. Thank you, Roger. Um, so across Europe, I would say we're seeing the beginnings of investigations of cases looking into crimes committed by extremist fighters, by ISIS, uh, by rebels in some cases, and increasingly but very slowly by members of the Assad regime. Um, I think it's ironic because obviously the vast majority of war crimes are, have been committed by the Assad regime and its allies. Um, that being said, I think there are some positive indicators, whether it's the issuing of these arrest warrants in the cases in Germany and France, particularly uh, against Jamil Hassan and, and Ali Mamluk, names who continue to exercise influence to various degrees in Syria. I think the beginnings of uh, the torture trial that's expected to begin this year, that's a case involving, I think, Syrian regime affiliates that uh, committed torture. That's a, that's a, a good start. It's not sufficient, and I think it's slow, and that's precisely why I think it's extremely important to, for us to be having interdisciplinary conversations with lawyers, civil society, victims, and policymakers to think about what limitations the legal scheme um, has, how can we strengthen laws in for places to be more like Germany, where we're seeing a lot of uh, positive movement. Um, how can we strengthen laws across Europe? How can we strengthen laws across the US, across Canada, to begin to uh, expand the tools? I think as we get 
farther and farther away. Um, it remains more, more important than ever for these conversations to be had. And I think as we think critically, when we begin to bring different folks in the room together, we begin to see, oh, these are where the loopholes might be, or this is how we can strengthen things together. I think the work that SJAC has done is excellent in this space, particularly in translating uh, and like putting together guides of using of understanding, first of all, universal jurisdiction and extraterritorial jurisdiction laws in countries, expanding those to the other countries. I think thinking even about setting up working groups for each of those countries to talk about implementation and access to begin to liaise with victim communities that we're increasingly seeing in places like Europe and the US. Those are places to start. Um, I, think, I think it will continue to be slow, but I'm seeing a lot of positive movement. And as um, we continue to advocate with our governments to even invest more resources into this space, particularly as violence wanes, if you will, there's, there's money that exists and that should be going towards supporting these accountability efforts. And I think engaging um, policymakers towards that will help, will help us see a little bit of movement. Um, but again, I think Prosecutions are not the end all be all, which we know as, as lawyers, there's a lot of different forms of accountability. And I think there's a premium put on prosecutions, but the reality is with a war as complex as Syria, there have been so many perpetrators and so many victims that it will be impossible, unfortunately, to hold all of them accountable. But in as much as we can support documentation, we can support the writing of history, we can support even victims to be heard. Maybe we should be thinking about other fora in which victims can be heard. I think then you open up the doors for justice a little bit. <laughs> we got to start somewhere. But thank you to SJAC for, for leading us in that space. All right, thank you. Uh, Contessa Bourbon, a journalist, asks, how are uh, civil society and the international community, the EU, uh, working to realize uh, peace settlement in Syria? What are the challenges they face? This is addressed to all three of you, if you care to. Uh, tackle this question, I'm sorry. the challenges being faced by civil society, the international community, particularly the EU, in trying to realize a peace settlement for, for Syria. What are their main challenges? Uh, if, if, if I just actually, um, of course, each crisis has some mostly disadvantages and some advantages. One of the, uh, the bright moments we had uh, the vibrant civ Syrian civil society we have, uh, comparing to other countries who, go in, who went through what Syria is going through right now, we don't see such a vibrant, active civil society. I just alluded to now two uh, documentary movies nominated for the Oscar. One of them even they won the best uh, documentary movie uh, uh, for Sema in, in, in UK and most likely she will win the Oscar as the best documentary. Uh, those two documentaries is one of the cases of documentation. Uh, for Sama, a movie, actually Wa'ad al-Khatib decided uh, to document her uh, memoirs in Aleppo in the last five years. After this 55,000 of, of, uh, uh, of images, uh, and they, they made one of, uh, 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 I mean, it's, it's a torture movie. Uh, I watched the movie without a dry eye. It's a, for almost two hours. It's a very powerful uh, movie. But that's uh, tell you about the role of the civil society, taking some small initiatives and, uh, and making it uh, 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 through. That's <coughs> very important. And, and I think now uh, the voice of justice and transition and justice in the Syrian crisis, it's unfortunately, it's, it's only became now the voice of the civil society. And those the people who are interested in justice and accountability. Uh, this is why there is uh, too much initiatives uh, in the last uh, uh, eight, nine years. But also we, we, we see the civil society is built on on the issues, and that's make the Syrian case much more creative. Uh, there are some cases, of course, uh, as Mai uh, mentioned, on universal jurisdiction uh, in Spain, uh, in Sweden. And in, of course, most of the cases focuses on the small fish. And that does not build the case anyway. 
but it's, it's of course it's a beginning uh, 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 t to in, in, in the book in my chapter I argue for the need to have an hybrid court uh, in, 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 in Syria. Uh, we have seven uh, special tribunals uh, uh, since uh, 1994. The first one, of course, of uh, former Yugoslavia, and the last one now, uh, the special chamber of, 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 of Cambodia. Those seven established by uh, Security Council resolution, except one of, of, of uh, Cambodia. Cambodia is kind of cooperation between the Cambodian government and the UN uh, General Assembly. And this is something actually we have to think of it. Uh, unfortunately, the Syrian government will not interested uh, in, 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 in the subject, but it can be the UN General Assembly as estab established the Trouble IM, which established the, the Office of Prosecutor before, before having the court, uh, to collect the evidences of, of war crimes and crimes against humanity, but it can open up to more creative ideas of, of an international hybrid court uh, to be able. Uh, it's, it's from regional perspective, such crimes happen in Syria, it cannot be happened unless we see the whole region where it's one of the weakest weakest legal institutions in the world. Uh, in the 80s and the 90s, uh, we, we all witnesses actually the waves of enforced disappearances in Latin America. Later on, when the, those actually transitioned into democratic governments, Latin America became the vanguard, the vanguard of, of, uh, of the ICC. Uh, the large number of the countries who actually pushed also of the universal uh, declaration against the enforced disappearances. And unless see actually a much more strengthened legal mechanism within the Arab state, within the Middle, Middle East, not Syria, maybe later Libya and in Yemen and other countries. This is why the need of regional mecha legal mechanism to be able actually uh, 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 to raise the issue of justice and accountability. Because the, the, this region, it's, uh, the immunity is became an answer. And we witnessed this question with the Khajiqshi in Saudi Arabia, and now what's going on in, in Yemen and in, in Libya, now in Syria. This is why we have to think not only about Syria specifically, but more about strengthening the regional mechanism uh, to make the region actually have. It already have some concept of justice and accountability, but it's never, never been the case to, to strengthen this mechanism uh, uh, to be able to prevent such kind of war crimes and crimes against humanity. Uh, just two quick things I would also add on uh, creative mechanisms for justice. I think one, uh, the importance of thinking and engaging on business and human rights, as um, Hamed was talking about with forced displacement, in those areas where there have been demographic change, countries and businesses are now competing for deals to invest and construct in Syria. And it's important that the legal and civil society community engage with businesses to make sure that they not further <laughs> war crimes that have been committed by the Assad regime. I think this is a space that there's a lot of momentum on and it's increasingly growing, but it it's a, remains an interesting way to hold not just individual actors and governments accountable, but also businesses as well. And the second thing I would say is the momentum around targeted human rights sanctions. In the US here, we have the Magnitsky Act and now sanctions vis-a-vis -vis the Caesar Bill. Um, countries around the world are considering targeted human rights sanctions and while also a piecemeal solution where you're not getting justice for larger entities, you're going after individuals, it is something I think worth considering, particularly as the EU, Australia, um, and I think a few other places as well are considering sanctions legislation. So civil society engaging with these governments to make sure that this legislation is targeted and goes after the bad actors, whether on human rights abuses or corruption, is also extremely important. Thank you. I would also add, uh, just to be, to be uh, frank, uh, that while civil society, uh, Syrian or otherwise European, etc., while civil society can support the bringing about of a political settlement uh, to the conflict in Syria, civil society on its own 
no matter what, how impressive the infrastructure or the resources that uh, it can uh, and should bring to the, to the table and to the conversation cannot on its own bring about an end to the conflict. This would, an end to the conflict, uh, negotiating an end to the conflict requires uh, that states, uh, especially key stakeholders, countries like uh, the United States, uh, Turkey, etc., uh, bring to bear uh, consequences, because the number one challenge that we face as civil society is, uh, frankly, the you know the total impunity that all these crimes that I talked about, may talked about, and Dr. Rodwan Ziade uh, in his presentation uh, went over. Complete impunity, so lack of lack of consequences. As you know, negotiations are all about leverage. No one is going to give up uh, at, the, at the negotiating table what they um, uh, gained on the battlefield. Since the beginning, the regime has been crystal clear that they're pursuing a military strategy to the conflict. In 2011, it was called a security solution, and then Assad called it military strategy. And uh, through uh, speeches to parliament, he also made that crystal clear. On the other hand, other stakeholders, uh, other countries like the United States have always always been wedded to the refrain that, quote unquote, there is no military solution to the conflict. OK, so there is a military solution that's being pursued. And that's why Assad has been able to, with the help of Russia and Iran, has been able to reestablish control or, uh, over you know, a large uh, swath of Syrian territory. Because you have the, uh, the, the, the other end of the table saying there is no, uh, there's only a political solution. So unless. Uh, there are consequences unless there's an end to impunity. Uh, I don't think we can ever have that. In 2000, uh, a political settlement, in 2011, uh, the, the American Department of the U.S. Department of State, uh, Ambassador Robert Ford came out and said, um, you know, the uh, aerial bombardment is a red line. The Assad regime was testing the waters at the, at, the, at the time. They went through with that. And then uh, the State Department came out and said, fixed wing aircraft is a red line. And the Assad regime, you know, lo and behold, used fixed-wing aircraft. And then they said, barrel bombs are a red line, and so forth. And then chemical weapons, most infamously or famously, in 2013, they were also supposed to be a red line. And as you know, there was a huge, huge, huge massacre, uh, a chemical attack, Ghouta, August 2013, and there were no consequences. Uh, so unless there is an end to impunity, unless there are consequences, there can be no leverage to use in negotiations. And without that, no uh, political settlement to the conflict can be negotiated. Uh, talking about uh, impunity, uh, Peter Humphrey, who's an intelligence analyst, uh, asks about the Russian role, targeting of schools particularly, and, and hospitals, and other forms of atrocities. Uh, can't we assure Russia that now, right now, that their pilots, their soldiers, their leaders, uh, Putin included, will face w war crime uh, <laughs> prosecution. Why wait till later, May? <laughs> well, I, I mean, I started by saying that we can't wait till later. The time for accountability and, imp and uh, accountability and justice is in the immediate. And I think the a small example, but the Caesar Act actually goes after the pilots and the and. Uh, Russia for the various crimes that they've committed in support of the Syrian regime. So that's just an example of the signaling that's being done. Um, I'm certain that organizations around um, Europe and the U.S. are beginning, if not already, have put together case files or at least evidence collection around this issue. Like I mentioned, the New York Times investigation that came out a few uh, weeks ago directly connecting Russia to the fl planes that actually bombed the hospitals in question. That's excellent evidence, and I am heartened to see that this is something that's being done not just in the civil society and legal space, but also on the media as this helps create momentum and it helps document the fact that Russia is complicit in these crimes. So I think we're already seeing that happen. Yeah, and uh, by the way, this New York Times investigation is also an example of how civil society can support uh, th these efforts. They, uh, while it was active, uh, and they're, they're, the New York Times on their own obtained uh, all those uh, uh, audio recordings that they used to uh, link Russia, uh, actually establish beyond any doubt uh, that Russia was behind those bombings of bread lines in schools and hospitals and so forth. 
we in the civil society we also did we we uh, we helped them uh, with that because they needed to be connected to eyewitnesses on the ground uh, they needed to acquire footage uh, and so forth and this is something that we helped uh, their team uh, with uh, the Caesar bill by the way is another example of how uh, civil society has helped I don't know if you know but the, the whole business of Caesar uh, started as an initiative by civil society. It was not uh, a state-sponsored uh, project at the time. We brought Caesar to Washington, D.C. Uh, Caesar uh, did a hearing in Congress. He met with the administration. Uh, he shared the, uh, the trove of, uh, of tens of thousands of photos he, he had with the FBI. The FBI authenticated the photos, you know, um, and uh, certified the photos. The photos were not doctored in any uh, way, shape, or form. And that eventually led to the drafting of the bill, and then the community, the Syrian American community, and others, and other allies, uh, threw their support behind the bill, and the bill eventually passed. And now it's state business. So uh, Caesar is also another example of how civil society can can help advance uh, this agenda. Uh, just to add here, the question of, of of Russia and Syria always puzzled me. Uh, because if you look at in the book, um, I make some comparison. Uh, Russia, um, until today, of course, uh, vetoed 15 Security Council resolutions in Syria, along with the China, almost nine. But the Soviet Union itself vetoed seven times. It looks actually, even in, 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 the, in, in areas, it's a part of the Soviet Union on Russia, like Georgia, uh, uh, Russia vetoed only twice. It's, uh, and it's, it looked like Syria, it's part of, of the deep national security issue in Russia to be more, in that's, Russia invested too much capital and co too much military investment in Syria and in, 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 in leave us as a Syrians question, why, why, why is that? What's Russia gaining? Uh, f f from all of that, with the, all these reports coming out, uh, uh, the image of Russia as, as uh, involved in war crimes and crimes of humanity everywhere, and there is no much uh, uh, economic gain uh, f f from uh, Syria since most of, most of the oil uh, controlled by the United States right now. This is, until today, it's a very difficult to answer this question from rational uh, uh, political scientist behavior. Uh, because it's a clear ra Russia, it's, it's a losing uh, any, 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 any way in Syria from any accounts, from, from justice or accountability, from its image, from uh, 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 economic investment or, but, but, but what Russia gaining from that, it, it, it's very difficult until today, actually, to find an answer. All right, we're going to conclude with the, this uh, question from Francisca, Middle East Institute. Uh, she thanks all three of you uh, for uh, giving inspiring presentation on the topic. However, the Assad regime, she says, is not the only human rights violator uh, a violation committer or violator in, in Syria. How do we hold other uh, violators uh, in other areas uh, of Syria also accountable, uh, particularly or such as, for example, the Turkish controlled areas, the SDF uh, controlled areas? We have three minutes, one minute each, please. Uh. I reject this kind of questions because that will leave actually some some crimes or war crimes in a vague. And as the Assad argue, always use this argument that uh, we are, and by the way, even Egypt used this argument and at the Arab League, that we are all in the same level of, of committing a, uh, a human rights violation, why we should care. This is not actually the values we should hold us account uh, for. Of course, it's, uh, the, there is a massive human rights violations in the region. But when we look into the Syrian regime and how acted against its, its people, no other accounts can be even close to. Uh, and who are the internal other players internally in Syria? And this is why, th this is why I, I need here. No, the, the Syrian government, it's not became rogue state. Mm -hmm. It's became 
deep sectarian militias that has no disregard to any life of any Syrians. And from, from reading day by day into the decision-making process of, of, of the government and how to give all these orders of the peril bombs and, 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 and uh, the political prisoners and, and all of that, it's, it's, it's impossible to, have to think about political settlement with such kind of militia and control of the Syrian resources in this way. If there is no international efforts actually to take military actions against the Assad government, and we already miss a lot of opportunities, and the famous one was the, 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 the red line, now this kind of sectarian militias involved it with the intervention of, of, of Russia in September 2015 uh, make it more difficult. What's the end answer? No, 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 uh, no Syrians or anyone actually have an, an answer of that. Because when you have such militia has a zero disregard of the law, zero disregard of, of, of the life of, of its own citizens, there is nothing to talk about it. There is nothing to leverage or negotiate about it. And we've seen that in the Geneva or in other, uh, in, in, in other places. Uh, the, uh, I'm, I'm very pessimistic, but this is the, re the reality. And in every time, actually, the United States or other countries try to leverage or negotiate, they come to the same conclusion that this is, uh, 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 and this is why I, I don't, I don't, there is uh, no end or any soon of uh, thing of, of, of political settlement uh, of the conflict in Syria. Yeah, so I, of, of course, I agree with the, with the premise of the question. Everyone, regardless of whether they're opposition, regime, uh, SDF, uh, uh, US-backed forces, Turkey, everyone who's committed human rights, uh, violations in Syria should be held to account regardless of who they are because at the end of the day the thing that we're trying the, the thing that we care about the most is justice and I don't believe that there can ever be uh, 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 peace without justice and I don't think we can ever uh, deal with the legacy as a person who is hoping to be able to go back to uh, to Syria one day I don't think we can stabilize the country unless we deal with with this legacy however I also agree with Dr. Rodwan Ziyadeh that we should always pose these questions while being completely and fully 100% cognizant of the fact that we should never create a false equivalency between uh, the massive uh, mammoth-like uh, uh, violations, war crimes, crimes against humanity committed by the Assad regime and uh, by other stakeholders. Because at the end of the day, this is definitely being used by by regime backers uh, uh, as a pretext to say, well, everyone is committing human rights, human rights violations. Everyone is doing that. Everyone is bad. There are no good guys here. Uh, and, and this is a very dangerous, uh, slippery slope. Even if you compare, uh, uh, the, uh, statistically speaking, if you compare the number of uh, casualties uh, um, of the ISIS reign of terror in Syria to the number of casualties uh, or number of deaths uh, that the uh, Assad regime caused in Syria, there's not even, like, you can't even come close. You're, you're talking basically uh, more than 90, 95% Assad, and you can, I, I would refer you to the statistics by uh, the Syrian Network for Human Rights, very credible source used by the State Department and, other, uh, and others, and I also know that the, the folks in charge, they're completely cre credible. Uh, you're talking 95% to like three, four percent. And here I'm using what is supposed to be the most horrendous example. I'm using ISIS. Uh, of course, the opposition also has committed, uh, some, some opposition groups or factions have also committed uh, violations. I would like to see them to account. But again, we need to be careful not to create a false equivalency. Now, in uh, a response to the question, what do we do to hold them to account? Well, at this level, at this stage, the only thing that we've been able to do is to actually document that. So uh, uh, Syrian Network for Human Rights documents all abuses, all violations, all crimes, regardless of who committed them. Uh, uh, yesterday, uh, different, not the Syrian Network for Human Rights, a different source. I was looking at a, a, a database they compiled of everyone, all civilians who were shot to death by Jordanian, uh, border guards and by Turkish border guards as they were se fleeing bombardment and seeking uh, safety in Jordan or in Turkey. Uh, and the database does not discriminate. It says Jordan, it says Turkey, etc. Uh, SDF also, uh, uh, we've seen uh, before that uh, uh, basically uh, 
coordinates, geographic coordinates were uh, given since SDF uh, receives close air support from the United States. In some instances, uh, coordinates were provided to, uh, uh, to, to the American military and civilian uh, uh, gathering uh, uh, points where civilians were gathering, like mosques, for example, were knocked, uh, knocked out, bombed, and hundreds of people were killed as a result. So there should also be accountability. Uh, so at this stage, what we can do and what we've done is do our best to meticulously uh, uh, document that. Uh, sadly, uh, there's, a, there's a very long way to go on, on that front, but we should do it while being cognizant that there's absolutely no, uh, that we shouldn't be uh, helping create, create this uh, false equivalency between the regime and any other actor in the Syrian conflict. Thank you, Mohammed. Might you have the final word? Sure. Uh, I think it's important to recognize that a victim is a victim. A victim of human rights abuse is a victim. And for the victim, it doesn't matter who committed the abuse. As legal advocates, as accountability, as civil society, it's our job to then ensure that everyone, to the best of our ability, has access to justice. And it will look different depending on who the perpetrator is. It will be different to hold the Syrian regime to account when they are the sitting government in a place as opposed to a militia. It doesn't mean that it's an either or question and I firmly believe as an accountability advocate it's not an either or question and I think that needs to be said um, I, and and the heartening thing is that in all of the initiatives that I talked about there is accountability against different actors I think it, we would do well to always recognize who committed crimes and what percentage and all of this but at the end of the day our role as advocates is really to ensure that there is accountability and to ensure that anyone who committed a war crime a human rights abuse a violation is held to account in some form one way or another okay thank you uh, for your great presentations thank you all for being here and for your patience